welcome to Making Stories Knits With. My name is Claire and if you're a regular viewer of ours, you're probably thinking, what the heck is going on? Because you're not Hannah Lisa and you would be correct. Um, <laughs> Hannah Lisa is normally the host of Making Stories Knits With. Um, but today it is my job to take over and do that. And that is because our guest today is a very good friend of mine and we thought it'd be fun to have a chat with each other so without further ado i'm going to introduce amanda barsanas hi friend <laughs> there she is thank you for having me <laughs> oh thank you for being here um amanda is the owner of predo delana sheep farm and um, why don't you give us a little introduction and tell us about yourself and your work and just tell the folks who you are. Sure. So my husband, Alberto, and I own Prado de Lana Sheep Farm. Um, we live in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, which is about almost as far west in Massachusetts as you can get to close to the New York border. Um, and we've lived here for about a year and a half and we raise three different breeds of sheep, um, Romneys, Lincoln Mongols, and Rommel CBM. And we've been doing this for about six years. We started our flock in Pennsylvania and have moved a couple of times. And um, yeah, we have also opened up a yarn store in Stockbridge um, where we feature not only our own yarns from our sheep, but yarns from other small flocks from all over the world. Yeah. lovely oh and what gorgeous yarns they are as well because i've been able to try a few which we're going to get to in a little while um but yeah I, I mean a little bit of a backstory um amanda and i we only became friends fairly recently um if anyone um saw the disaster that was my um <laughs> cruelty-free yarn blog post in August, um, you will know that I made a terrible job of that. And um, Amanda, along with lots of other lovely, very generous people, very rightly called me out on it and told me that I'd made a blundering mistake. And um, we got to backtrack and I got to speak to Amanda because um, you very kindly came forward and said, hey, that's wrong, um, but do you want to have a chat about why that is? And of course I did. Um, and what started from there was such a lovely friendship that's come from it, which I'm very excited about. So it was definitely a silver lining from that whole thing. And um, along the way, I've just got to know more about you and your work. And, and I've completely fallen in love with it and you. And that's why when Hannah Lisa was like, who shall we have as a guest on Making Stories Knits With? I was like, we should definitely have Amanda on especially because I had such a lovely chat at the time and there's only a tiny amount of that original conversation that you and I had that I could put into that blog post um sure. just for reference if anyone wants to read that blog post um I did a revision on it which has um a lot of words from Amanda in there amongst other lovely people from the fiber community um I'll link that to the bottom. It's the revised one, but it also has the old horrendous one at the bottom <laughs> that you can read for reference to just to give the other one context. Um, but anyway, I'll link that at the bottom if you want to read it. Um, but yeah, through that, I just got to mo know more about you and your work. So I thought we had to have you on to share more about what you're doing. And um, I've got a few questions for you. I'm gonna dive straight in. Sure. I got prepared just because I was a little nervous taking over from Hannah Lisa. So my question's written right here. Um, no, but yeah, I know. <laughs> I know that just from talking agriculture and sustainability is obviously something that's been very dear to your heart all the way through. And I'd love to know a little bit more about how that kind of evolved into, hey, let's start a sheep farm and um, and start Prado de Lana and everything and like the origins of where that business came from. Yeah, so it was, I don't want to say it was random. Both Alberto and I have agriculture degrees. Um, mine was in animal science and his was in agronomy. Um, neither one of us were really using those degrees at the time. I was teaching high school biology 
Um, and he has been an estate manager for the last, gosh, I think 12 years or so. Um, and that's how we started our farm in Pennsylvania. We, he was the estate manager for this property. Um, that was 120 acres. And, um, you know, it was just a shame to see uh, these beautiful fields and pastures just being mowed all the time, just to remain, uh, keep that kind of pristine manicured look. Mm. Um, but we knew that the owners were very involved in, you know, sustainability and, you know, that kind of lifestyle. Um, and so I had recently started knitting maybe a year or two before that. Um, I had gone on bed rest with my daughter um, for like half of my pregnancy and started knitting again because I'm just so bored. <laughs> <laughs> you can only like watch so much TV. Thankfully, it wasn't like a hardcore bed rest where I wasn't allowed to get out of bed or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It was just, you know, take it easy kind of thing. Um, so a friend had started knitting and so we went to a local yarn store that was just right down the road from us and you know I picked out a woolly wool and not even really paying attention to kind of what was in there or you know looking at the fiber content really um, and so you know started knitting again and then we just well, like it would be so awesome to have some sort of livestock here that could do the mowing while fertilizing, um, but not something so huge like cattle, um, because we just didn't have that knowledge <laughs> or not that we had knowledge about sheep before that, but cattle just seems so like daunting and you need a lot bigger equipment and facilities and like you can't handle them. Like, yeah, they my arms they, around a sheep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think you can do that with a cow as much. <laughs> no. And yeah, I mean, there's just something so where we were living, we lived outside of Philadelphia and where we were living um, was just so pastoral and beautiful and open. Mm -hmm. um, like sheep just like, even if we didn't do anything with them, they just looked really beautiful there. Um, so we started researching different breeds. Um, I knew I wanted something that was more on the long wool side, um, cause I just wanted like a massive fleece. Yeah. And, something really uh, woolly and poofy. Some, yeah. And heavy and just awesome. And <laughs> fine wools aren't that. <laughs> that's what I was, that was what I was kind of drawn towards. Um, and you know, there were things that we had planned we didn't want to breed that had horns because there just comes extra management with horns um with like fencing and that kind of thing um is that because they can it's harder to keep stuck. them pinned in oh they get yeah. stuck oh yeah and we weren't totally at the time we had um slit rail fencing which yeah. was just wooden fencing but we had to cover part of it with like uh a metal mesh kind of fencing mm -hmm. so I don't know we just and it was more so um I think almost just I mean I think sheep with horns are beautiful mm -hmm. um, but there aren't very many long wool sheep that have horns either so we uh, we settled on Romneys and for a lot of different reasons um they just they come in a variety of natural colors uh, they're on kind of the finer end of the long wools. Um, and there are a lot of farms that we were able to choose from. So we started researching farms and we contacted a farm in Vermont and it kind of just happened magically with them because they were wanting to kind of start transitioning to, to owning Gotlands and Kind of starting to downsize their Romney flock. So yeah, we purchased our first three Romneys from Kim and Chuck Goodling in Vermont. And um, yeah, we brought home Hazel, Holly, and Fiat. And it was like, 
one of the best days of my life. Oh, so, so nice. Yeah, they're just like woolly Ewoks. <laughs> that's, that's what Romneys look like. Um, especially when they're like, because they're like big woolly teddy bear Ewok kind of um, So yeah. And- uh, they are gorgeous sheep. I, I mean, since we got to know each other, I mean, obviously I started following you on Instagram as well. And honest to God, one of my favorite things of the day is finding your posts on Instagram and seeing the sheep and the other day when you introduced Hans to the flock and the handsome boy he is and um it's just so nice because just you can kind of see as you're going around like it's just the animals seem to really interact with you and they're so beautiful and um it's just a lovely thing to see and I get really excited when I see them every day on Instagram so Oh, thank you. Um, for the people who don't know, you mentioned a few times about how you wanted like a long wool breed. Yeah. Um, what is what is what does that mean basically, and why was it something that you were uh, that you wanted for the, your yarns and your sheep? So a long wool breed um, is usually um, a breed that has. I would say like a six plus staple length, probably even longer than that. If you were to let them grow full fleece for one year, um, it, they would probably fall somewhere between like the eight and like 14 inch staple length. So the actual mm-hmm. length of the lock. Mm-hmm. Um, usually long wools are on the coarser side. So with Romneys, they have a micron count, which is a micron count calculates the diameter of the of the wool Mm -hmm. and um, the lower the number the finer the wool the higher the number the coarser the wool so Romneys have somewhere between a 32 to like 39 micron count Um, so they're on the coarser end of the spectrum but not super coarse um, like our Lincolns So with the Romneys, I just, I really loved how they looked. Um, They're puffy. Um, A lot of long wools have like long, like curly locks. Yeah. But the Romneys are puffy. Um, So yeah, they look like bears. They do. They're like real fluffy cloud-like sheep. They're so cute. Yeah. And like I said, they come in um, so many different colors i know over like in the uk there's mostly just white rummies um but here we have natural colored and they range from black to silvery gray to taupe kind of colors oh that's lovely and you know depending on genetics then you can get different kind of coloring patterns and you know things like that so yeah i really love them and they're they're great mothers. They're really docile. I mean, I, if you have seen some of our videos, like you said, they kind of just follow us around. <laughs> they, do. they really do. Yeah, they're they're not very skitt- skittish as a breed. Obviously, individuals differ. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, because it's just Alberto and I managing them, we have to have them be as friendly as possible so that yeah. we're not, like, running around like nutsos trying to catch them (laughs) we don't have a full facility where we can guide them into shoots and things like that and a big barn um we don't have herding dogs we just have guardian dogs so yeah it's just alberto and i you know wrangling the sheep when we need to and so yeah the friendlier they are the more trustworthy they are for us and of us it makes it just a ton easier to to manage them. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, like you said before, they are manageable and they're smaller, but then that's fine if there's one. If there was a whole flock of them kind of deciding that they weren't very happy that day, that must get a little bit... I find that quite overwhelming. And and then the sheep would probably be herding me (laughs) to the next pen. (laughs) You must have to have, 
I mean, and that kind of comes back to that, um, like I said, that it's so lovely seeing you with them on Instagram because there's that real relationship between you and your animals and just that overwhelming sense of love and trust between the two, um, which is a lovely thing to see. Um, I'd love to hear a bit more about that kind of relationship with the animals that you have. Sure. So, um, you know, a, a lot of it is genetic. Uh, I, I feel like there's um, more sheep that are more docile than others. Um, not that other sheep are aggressive, but they may just be more skittish. Mm -hmm. um, have more of that like fight or flight kind of mode in them. Um, but yeah, so we, we work really hard in the time where we wean lambs. So when, when lambs are born, because our, our sheep have wonderful mothering instincts and characteristics, I don't tend to bond with their lambs much mm -hmm. at the beginning because I really want the mother lamb bond to be very strong because I don't, I want the mother to take care of her lamb. Yeah. I don't want to be involved in that if I don't have to be. Um, so the better the bond between them, I know the better cared for that lamb is going to be. Sometimes we have to step in and that's okay too. I mean, things happen. Mm -hmm. So, but when we start weaning lambs, so we when we separate the mothers from the lambs, that's when I really try to take that opportunity to become more bonded with those lambs and then I know down the line that they'll become more trustworthy of me as they get older and I can manage them better mm -hmm. and they trust me to do things things like hoof trimming and you know they get a vaccination every year and if they need something else if something comes up then it's not such a big deal and it's not stressful on them it's not stressful on us mm -hmm. um, if we know we have to do something like for a large group, then we try to like break it into maybe a few days so that mm -hmm. it's not so taxing on us and not stressful for the sheep because they, they know what we're going to do stuff. Yeah. <laughs> they're not, they're not dumb. Um, <laughs> they know when something is up. So yeah. like I was putting on, I was, we, co we coat some of our sheep, so I was putting coats on the other day and, you know, they're always very curious. I was laying out the different sizes of coats and, um, you know, some are just like, oh yeah, the coat. that's great. Others were like, eh, lady, I don't know. <laughs> and then some were like, get away from me. And like, they headed for Because <laughs> they knew something was up. And not that it hurts them or anything, but they're just like, yeah. So... But yeah, I think we just, we really try to always be as hands-on with them as possible um, because that's how we have to manage them yeah. to make it easier for us. I There are so many different ways to manage sheep. Um, and I know people who have giant flocks, you know, don't have that ability to, to have necessarily a personal relationship with their sheep. And that's okay too. Yeah. Um, because they have other ways of managing them. For mm -hmm. us, because it's just us and we don't have like a lot of equipment and a you know, barn and whatever, this works out best for us. Yeah. And because of that, you know, we, we are able to know our sheep really well. And I know when something is off with, with one of them. So, and I have come to know like their behavior individually. So I can tell if someone's not feeling well or, you know, if they are, I don't know, if I know somebody has a hoof problem, I know mm -hmm. how I need to approach them based on kind of how their personality is. So. That's so cool. It's so nice that you've got that personal co connection with them all. And like you said, some, some farmers and shepherds aren't able to do that if they're on a bigger scale. Um, it's so lovely that you are able to do that. Um, but one of the things I found really interesting when 
I, I spoke to several people um, after that blog post and it's that when it comes to being a shepherd or a shepherdess, um, it's there's never like a set of guidelines to follow to look after that particular flock. Wherever you go, each farm will have to deal with the livestock in a completely different way to what suits them and the livestock um, in those particular situations, which I find fascinating because from the outside, we're not having any experience at all. It's kind of like, oh, they're a farmer. They look after the sheep. They must do A, B and C and, you know, everything's cool. But it's such, it seems like a very kind of reactive kind of not learning on the job kind of thing but just that you have to adapt to that certain set of your situation that you've got and what your particular breed of sheep because like you said some are skittish some aren't some have hot like there's all these different factors to take into consideration which is what I found really interesting when I was speaking to everyone and Look, there must be things that come up all the time though that you're like oh god like now we have to deal with this situation so what are we going to do about that and it's not like you can just go to like the handbook of how do we deal with this now you can have to go with what your flock are telling you right a lot of times i mean yeah every day is different ish not that there's an issue necessarily but you know like today you know it's just started getting really cold like below freezing at night and so we have to deal with like frozen water in the morning so it just takes uh, things a little bit longer yeah. which is fine um because i know during the months of like may through thankfully i mean thankfully it's been warm up until now the weather has been really nice our sheep have been freezing up until now basically oh, good. um so that's been awesome um, so yeah, it just, things change with the seasons and things come up and I will say, yeah, there are books and there are things to read and, you know, find information online of, you know, different studies and things like that. Some of it is just, you know, you got to just pull all of your knowledge together and figure out a situation. But then I also rely, I mean, we both do rely heavily on our friends who are shepherds too, mm -hmm. um, because chances are, if they've dealt with that same issue, then they have a solution or yeah. know somebody who has dealt with that, that same issue and connect us with that person. Or even if they don't even know what's going on, cause lots of weird stuff happens. Yeah. I can imagine. <laughs> and there's, there's no way to like find, find an answer to it. I mean, the issue too with owning sheep is that there are not very many veterinarians that are small ruminant specific. So dealing with sheep and goats. So mm. chances are they're more just a general large animal that, and they're probably specializing more in like cattle and pigs. Yeah. Um, so, you know, even they don't know. So a lot of it comes from just like, Hey, have you tried this? Mm. This might work. Hey, have you tried this? This is you know, I found this research, you know, we rely heavily on the shepherding community to like keep each other, you know, in the loop and just like, even if they can't offer me a solution, they're like, Hey, we've got your back, whatever happens, you know, that's awesome. Just having the support. Yeah. So, or throwing out ideas and, you know, or have you tried this kind of thing? And that is, I feel like, just as valuable having just support because sometimes shepherding feels a little lonely yeah because um, you're just you're out there with your flock and trying to figure things out on your own sometimes mm -hmm. so yeah in dealing with things life and death and sickness and things like that can get can get weary sometimes so yeah. it's nice to know that other people are going through it too so I can imagine because it's very much, you know, you're not going to, you can't just go and take a holiday, say, oh, it's been a rough couple of weeks. I'm going to take, I'm going to take off for two weeks and go do this. Or I, I don't feel like doing it today. It clearly not that kind of a job. It's not like I'm going to stay in bed today because I just, it was a rough week. You still have to be going out and doing the same things and looking after the flock. So that, 
can imagine that gets quite physically and emotionally draining at the same time and like you said if it's just like the two of you dealing with that without that support system it must get very lonely and kind of really overwhelming I can imagine at times yeah sometimes um like so Sunday we put all of our breeding groups together so that was an all-day thing figuring out pens breeding pens <laughs> because <laughs> we really I mean we do have some cross breeds but we mostly are breeding purebred um so and then I have to think about pedigree and genetics amongst the different breeding groups because not everybody can just be bred to right particular ramp or whatever so yeah it was exhausting by the time we got home i think we started around 9 30 or so and we got done around 3 3 30 like getting everyone situated and everything and it was of course we picked like the coldest day <laughs> the windiest day like the wind oh. around but yeah we were exhausted but we still had to come back later and make sure everybody was okay and just not breaking out and so <laughs> But yeah, you know, we signed, we, this is what we signed up for. And, you know, we know that we just aren't going to always be able to take a vacation all the time yeah. or just get away or whatever. Um, and that's okay. I mean, part of it is we chose this lifestyle and this work. And so, you know, everything has a pro and a con to it but you know always our first priority is making sure that the sheep are healthy and happy and taken care of and safe and so we don't mind doing it i mean sometimes yeah it stinks when you know, it's downpour raining mm -hmm. and you have to go out and you're getting soaked but there's also a lot of really like today it's like snowing a little bit but it was so pretty outside and it was so nice and the sheep were like they love this kind of weather they're like yes finally <laughs> you know? yeah. and same with the dogs the dogs are like it's snowing <laughs> and you know you would think that it was had we had like a foot of snow the way they were acting because they really like to like dig tunnels and roll around in it and whatever oh. but yeah everybody is just it was so beautiful and quiet and still today and as we were driving back, Alberto was just like, you know, if it can kind of be like this, this winter, it will be a really nice winter. You know, yeah. snow here and there. Um, yeah, it was so beautiful today. So it's things like that, that we're, you know, we're thankful that it was a nice day today. And you yeah. just kind of have to take the good with the bad, you know, just like yeah. anything. Yeah, I can imagine. I'm totally with you on the snow as well it's funny I actually did a very similar thing because we had the tiny scattering of snow overnight and I did the the same thing as the dogs I ran outside and I was like it's snowing today um <laughs> I didn't dig any tunnels but um I was very excited um but yeah and I think that's a great mantra because I can imagine you know when things do get bad um on the farm they can get very bad um so I can kind of see where you'd have to have that the good and the bad and kind of balance it out and because I think people take a very I mean I know I have in the past there's always that like romanticized view of oh it'd be lovely to own a farm and um tend the flock every day and especially if you're a knitter have a, an abundance of wool to knit with um that people can very easily kind of like get carried away and while I'm sure there are moments where it's absolutely beautiful like that like you said it's kind of like it looks like really hard work from the outside and it's you know it's not it's not a job it's like a, a lifestyle it's kind of a way of a way of life not right not just a thing that you drop into now and again so um right but well, we were just talking about too like I mean it's it's emotional for us all the time mm. um very high emotions to like very low emotions and you know um, I think a lot of people think oh they're just livestock or you know, 
you don't get upset if something bad happens or whatever, you know, yeah. it's just part of, and it is part of, part of it, but it's still difficult sometimes um, to deal with emotionally. And so like we were talking this morning on our way back, we have some youths who are very old. Um, I think one is 14, one is 13, one is 12. And we know they're all in really good condition and they're still like hanging with the flock and eating well and great, but we just know we're on borrowed time with them Mm -hmm. and that that will be difficult when that day comes when they pass away. Just because you go to, to love them so much so yeah, I think any passing of any animal is always difficult in any yeah. circumstance. So yeah, I think it's um it's one of those things. I think it's very easy from the outside to say you view that as just an animal or it's just livestock. And oh my god, I mean, if anyone even remotely watches the podcast, they know I'm absolutely besotted with Tilly, who is not here today. <laughs> I went from like, yeah, I like dogs to you have to look at all the pictures of my dogs because I'm obsessed with her. Um, And I think it's, you know, it's hard. I think if you're on the outside, it's kind of like, oh, well, they've got livestock, they've got this and that, and you can't get attached to animals, but you're going to get attached to animals. It's just, it happens, doesn't it? And I'm the biggest softie in the world when it comes to animals. Like I said, anytime I see your Instagram posts, I'm like, oh my God, I think I like comment on everyone going oh my god it's so cute um because it's just you have that feeling for them and yeah I can imagine that must be horrendously hard to um ever have to say goodbye to any of the animals so I would be a quivering mess (laughs) I'd be useless to you I'm fairly certain if I were there um yeah but I would like to show people um yeah, because we've kind of been teasing them all the way along and a little spoiler it's awesome um and I'm not Aww. just saying that it's funny because um since Amanda sent me some yarn in the post very kindly um for me to try out my intention today was to have all three full skeins to show you and already I've knit a hat because I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't cope it was just too much fun and um this is the first time Amanda and I have spoken since she sent them in the post and I'll repeat again what I'm I said to her that it's hard when your friends send you things because then it's like oh are they just being polite if I Amanda was an absolute monster I would still love this yarn (laughs) um she isn't she's absolutely awesome I'd love her to death um but her yarn is gorgeous um and yeah I've already knit a hat and um but this is I'm going to show you show people the label I'm also going to pop a few photos of your yarn over so people can see it properly and see some of the other fun colors um but I'm so excited for your yarn um so this is it looks so nice in that hat I'm excited I can't it needs blocking and it needs ends weaving in and um and a pom-pom but um I can't wait to wear this when I'm wandering with Tilly um But tell us a little bit more about your yarn. It's it's worsted spun, if I'm correct, which yeah. is the best thing for um, long a long wool. A long wool. That's correct, isn't it? I've been trying yeah. to like. I think so. Yeah, I ha- I I think I read that. I was binge reading Clara Parks. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> Book of but, wool. Book of wool, which is absolutely mind-blowing when you start reading it is like how is all this in wool um so yeah the bible of wool it is isn't it it's so interesting um so I've been learning a little bit more just through there so I can understand um but yeah tell us more about it because I absolutely love this yarn so do you want me to talk about ovejas first Sure, why not? Because that's got a lovely backstory to it as well, which I'm super interested in too. So Ovejas started in necessity that we needed more yarn in our shop Um, because our own yarn from our own flock sells very quickly. Mm. 
just because I think people like knowing that it's local or, you know, they've been following us for a long time. So they know the sheep and where they come from and all of that stuff. So we decided that maybe because wool is such a hard thing to sell for a lot of farmers, um, and especially selling it in a finished form like yarn, I mean, it's a lot of money up front that somebody has to put out for the processing of it. Yeah. And not everybody wants to, to do that for, you know, a couple of different reasons, you know, not wanting to maybe put the money out up front or maybe not having an avenue in how to sell it. And so, yeah. And then wool prices in the United States are dismal. Um, like we're talking like 10 cents a pound. So, mm. you know, so it's not even worth for a farmer to take their wool to the wool pool because it doesn't even cover the cost of gas or to pay the shearer or things like that. So Ove has started with the idea of one, we needed to have more wool and more local, as local as we could get it, wool, and to also help support farmers of wool sheep and not only support them, but also bring in as much breed diversity as possible um, to the shop. And so we started with a farm that is two towns from us um, in Egremont, and they also raise Romneys. And, you know, he had approached, him and his wife had come to the store one day and were like, yeah, we raise Romneys too. And I was like, of course, my ears pricked up. And we're like, well, what do you do with your wool? And he was like, you know, we've had it, you know, spun into yarn, but it's taking a really long time to sell it because basically they were only selling it in farmer's markets. And, yeah, you know, probably not the best place to sell yarn because people are going for like their fresh veggies and cheese and all that yeah. kind of good stuff. So I said, you know, hey, if you're interested, I would, we could carry your yarn here. Or if you just don't even want to bother with making yarn anymore, we could talk about maybe just buying your wool clip. And so we, we did that. We bought their entire clip last year. So they have both white and then some natural color. Mm -hmm. And so we sent it to the mill. Our mill is in Pennsylvania. Um, and just a plug for our mill they they're a small family farm too and a small business and it's difficult to find woolen mills that can spin a long stable length like ours because we shear once a year we don't shear twice a year so a lot of woolen mills can only spin up to maybe a five or six inch staple length all right so, yeah so there aren't very many worsted or semi-worsted spinning mills in the United States, at least ones that are close enough for us to use. Yeah. So that's, we've been using this mill probably for about four, four and a half years now and have been very happy with what they've been doing for us. And, oh, nice. You know, yeah. They're really great about pushing us through in the queue because they know as a small producer and a small business, we need yarn as fast as possible. We yeah. Can't wait a year for a product to come back. So yeah, we sent, we sent this Romney wool down to the mill and had it's, it's um, semi worsted spun. So meaning it's spun smoothly, all the fibers are aligned. Mm -hmm. um, and so you get a smooth yarn versus kind of a fuzzy yarn, like wool and spun. And yeah. And it is, enough. um, it is really like, it's so nice. Oh, look at the natural colors. Yeah. So this is, we got, yeah, kind of a natural brown that has like gray in it and then the white. Um, and Romney is just, I think if you're somebody who is new to using like farm yarns, Romney should be like one of the first ones that you've tried. Definitely. It should be like your, your gateway into farm yarns. Because it's really soft like um it's still soft and it has good stitch definition and it's squishy and 
just kind of all the great characteristics. Yeah, it really does. I mean, um, I don't know if people can see that very well, but for cables and bobbles as well, it's yeah. so nice. And it's it's got a luster to it as well. Like it's got a definite shine to it, which, yeah. and it obviously takes color really well as well. Yeah. Because you've got, you've been naturally dyeing them I love yeah. the colors you dye. I got so. I mean, oh, I when you asked me to pick some colors, I mean, you couldn't get the very clear colors that I that you sent me over. Um, but I was struggling for ages to pick them because you have so <laughs> many lovely. It was terrible. We were on um on um Instagram messaging while you very patiently waited while I went back and forth trying to decide what colors to pick um, because they're just and also lovely. Just say- Thanks. By no means am I like a professional dyer. I, I'm putting that disclaimer out <laughs> right, right now. <laughs> it's just been kind of like a fun experiment because we had all of this yarn and being that we only had like two natural colors, you know, we thought, hey, it could be great if we could dye some of this. So some of it yeah. is over dyed on the natural brown. So you get like a deeper, richer Ooh, I love color. that. And then that has more heathering to it because that's just how the natural is, mm. the natural brown. And then the white is dyed too, but you get just a more saturated tonal kind of color. Oh, it's, so it's been fun. Yeah. yeah. And for not a um, professional dye, I think you're doing pretty well personally because you've got some really awesome colors and I absolutely love them. Oh, I think yeah, it's gorgeous. been fun. Yeah, so we have Romney right now, and then at the mill is, um, so we, our shearers are really great too because they're kind of like our wool back alley dealers to us. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Siri and Colin, I'll I I follow where they're going for shearing and try to see like who they're shearing and what breed they're shearing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they'll contact me too and say, Hey, we have a big quantity of blah, blah, blah. Would you be interested in it? So right now at the mill, we sent down 300 pounds of white and natural colored Merino um, from a farm in Rhode Island. Is this what you posted about on Instagram? um the other day I started following them as well because it looked so cool um uh the new and it was like a merino clip that you got from that was it yeah I got a um a merino clip from that when did I get it I think I picked it up like early fall or summer I can't remember Ooh, that's so exciting there's, yeah there's definitely I think I put a post in there because my friend um and her daughter and then my daughter we went to go pick it we met siri and colin in a parking lot and to me 300 pounds of wool i'm like nah, that's not that much when you're dealing with a long wool because the yeah. wool is heavy but 300 pounds of a fine wool is a lot of wool and i just brought my we have just a Tahoe and I'm like there'll be plenty of room like we'll fit all this wool in there oh man it was <laughs> like wedged between <laughs> trash bags of wool it was ridiculous like, it wasn't that long of a ride but yeah so that's at the mill right now and hopefully we'll have that know, sometime next year um I don't that's I don't cool know any sort of date that we needed it by so yeah i'm constantly just you know watching siri and colin and who they're shearing and what they're shearing and you know staying because we can all help each other out to i love that as much breed specific wool out there as possible i just really want every every skein of every type of wool to be in somebody's hand to know that they have all these great characteristics that can be knit or crocheted or woven into, so. And I'm 100% with you. I'm such, I think as soon as you start using breed specific yarn, if you've never done it before, it's almost like it starts you on this path. Like 
the first time it happens, you're like, this is nothing that I've ever used before. The first time I kind of came across it was um, my sister got me a skein of, I think I talked about it on the, um, on the blog once. Um, she brought me like a skein of yarn back from, I think it was a goat farm. Um, when I was still living in England, it was ye- like maybe 14, 15 years ago. And that was my first introduction to like a farm yard, like a farm yarn, farm yard yarn. I can't say that. Um, and I was kind of, it's hilarious because I still have the yarn. And if I feel it today, it's like, I mean, it's like goat yarn. It's like a very long step, but it's very kind of like, Ooh. it's very shiny. It's very soft. It might even be mohair. I'm not 100% I was sure. I say, I bet it's from an Angora goat. If it's yeah. Super long and shiny. Yeah, it's, it's very long, very shiny, um, very soft. But at the time, I kind of, because then I kind of been knitting with whatever my friend's mom had given me or whatever so probably like acrylic or something else in there and I was used to like supermarket knitting that was normally acrylic and um I remember getting hold of it thinking oh it feels weird and it's like different and I don't know what to do with it and it's I thought it was rough at the time I was like oh no it's too like rough and it's like one of the softest things ever especially compared to yarn I'll use now and um yeah but it was kind of like the name of the goats were on it and it was kind of started like this little journey almost into like oh there are like different types of fibers out there that you can look at and experiment with and it kind of and I think as soon as you kind of start experiencing that you kind of want to experience more to try all the different characteristics which is the lovely thing about breed specific yarns which was again one of the other reasons when your yarn came in the post I kind of like ripped it open and it came out and I was like and it was I hadn't used Romney before um I've been using mainly um woolen spun yarns for a little while because I just had so many projects that use them and it was kind of like oh I got hold of it and I was like oh it's so nice and it feels different (laughs) to like what I've been using and it went straight on my needles and that's the exciting discovery about breed specific yarns for me um and I think it is with a lot of people so I'm completely 100% with you um in trying to get more out there and showing people what they're missing if they've never tried breed specific yarns right well, and then within our own flock, I get a little more nutso in that <laughs> I know the mill. I know every time she's just like, <sighs> but, you know, I, we have such a great array of natural colors within our flock that to just like blend all the Romney together, I think would just be such a sit. Um, so like, I really try to combine fleeces that are very similar in color and very similar in stable length and Mm. even maybe like feel because within individuals of the breed you have some variance between you know stable length and crimp and things like that Mm. um so yeah like I really I mean when we only had like 10 sheep it was easy for me to just spin every fleece individually but now that we have like 70 sheep you know I can blend things together but still get like a good I'm just going to show you these array of natural colors and because I can do that then I can provide different weights Ooh, of I the same color those. yeah so these are all DK weights um, these two happen to be Romney, so we have like a silvery gray and then like a more of a medium charcoal gray that probably has more of a under brown undertone. And then this is some of our Lincoln, so 100% pure Lincoln, um, and it has like a nice halo. It does. I was just going to say that. Yeah. Um, and then this is one of our crosses. This is a Romney. CVM cross and they have a kind of a creamy they're creamy white not bright bright white so oh it's lovely yeah so yeah I really I try not only just to be breed specific but then also to be color specific yeah 
which it gets a little insane. But <laughs> worth it though, because look at the outcome. Totally worth it. Yeah. yeah. And then I know there are just some places that, you know, really like to be spun like in a DK weight or some places that, you know, with the Lincolns, because they are very coarse, I never spin them less than a DK weight. They're always spun in like a DK to worsted to even a bulky weight, just because I feel like by that time they get to be a little twangy feeling. Yeah. And that's not pleasurable to knit with. So, see, that's yeah. just what I think that's part of what makes your yarn so special because when you're getting the skein of it, it's not just kind of like the feel, it's knowing that kind of your knowledge of the sheep has also gone into how that yarn has been processed. So, it's like the outcome of that particular yarn that you have in your hands is kind of directly influenced by your knowledge of each individual sheep which is just kind of mind-blowing to me I find it so exciting and so interesting that I don't know it just feels really special and I think it's a big part of what makes your yarn so special um and it's just so nice to get to share it with people on um on our YouTube channel because more people should discover it because it's so exciting thank you (laughs) Oh, it's good. Well, I have just one question to ask you left. um, And that was that, you know, we've been chatting a lot about um, running a farm and clearly that is very time consuming and a hell of a lot of hard work. But you also run a gorgeous yarn shop, which every time I see a picture of it, I basically just want to like hunker down in there and just live there for the rest of the time Aww. because it's so beautiful. That's what I'm hoping. Once this whole mess with COVID is done and we can all travel and see each other again, I just want all the people to just hang out with me for like a week. <laughs> I will be there. Yeah. I Try and stop me because it will be so <laughs> much fun. Um because every time you post a picture of that yarn shop and when we've been chatting like on our three hour long um, <laughs> FaceTime chat, it's not only from the shop and I'm just always like, oh, I wish I could be there. Um, but you're also running the farm and you're running a yarn shop and there's a pandemic going on. Um, it's a lot. Um, and I just wanted, one of you wanted to talk a little bit about maybe that experience and and how you actually managing to do that? Because from the outside, I kind of be losing my mind by this point, I think. I think there was definitely like, so at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, it was we're like, okay, you know, we'll see how things go. And, you know, then just because everything was closed or had to be closed unless you were an essential business, you know, it just kind of dragged on forever. And thankfully, you know, we have a website and we've had a website for a really long time. So like that was already set up and and not something that I had to do in the midst of all this. So it was great to be able to still function virtually mm-hmm. without having the shop open. But yeah, we had only open, opened the shop since like last year. October. So we weren't even open an entire year when this Oof. pandemic started, which is, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. But thankfully, you know, the area that we are living in has been very safe. And I think um, we've done a really good job in, you know, making sure that things are being followed so that we can remain open. Um, so, yeah, business has slowed down a little bit, but I think. People have also really rallied around small businesses and supported us in so many different ways so that maybe we wouldn't have had otherwise. So yeah. it's been, not that it's been like easy peasy at all, but it could have been a lot worse. And I know that there are a lot of people who have gone through or are going through a lot worse right now. So I have to feel very thankful and grateful that we're still able to have our doors open and, you know, still being able to pay our bills and things like that. But you know, not knowing how it's going to be over the next couple of months, just because of 
everything that's been going on. Yeah. You know, we hope that we can still have our doors open and still receiving support to, you know, one skein of yarn purchased means a lot to us. Yeah. So, or, you know, whatever, just coming in and something more. If, and even if people can't purchase things, just, you know, spreading the word, you know. Yeah. That's, and that's the thing. Like that. That's what we always say as well, that it's, it's, if you can support someone financially, it's awesome if you can do that everyone's kind of in a really sticky situation these days so if you can't support people financially that is absolutely fine but just kind of like checking in with small businesses and spreading the word and kind of like even sharing on Instagram or whatever it goes such a long way because you could put them in the path of someone who can and wants to support financially so so yeah absolutely um it's super important because we've seen I've seen too many of the small businesses unfortunately falling by the wayside um, yeah. and it massively sucks so anything we can all do is just kind of like that's right. the way I see it I agree yeah. and yeah just yeah just helping and, and not, only, not only just our small business but you know really still getting wool out there and you know I, that's just kind of my mission just to really promote wool and yeah. how awesome it is because it really think can be the solution to a lot of things um, environmentally and you know just yeah we need more wool out there in more people's hands <laughs> I, you won't hear me complain about that at all I want all the wool especially all of your wool <laughs> Oh, well, that just brings us to one last question because we're yeah. super nosy over here. So <laughs> we will always want to know what is on your needles and also what is that gorgeous cowl around your neck because it's beautiful. Oh, so a friend of mine, <laughs> Heather Davis, Needle and Pearl, she knit this for me. Oh, it's gorgeous. It's a shop sample. So this is some of our natural colored um, CVM, Rumbledale, actually rosemary. And then I had dyed these two with some of our CBM Rom uh, Romney crosses. Oh, it's lovely. So it is the Sandcast Cow by Jen Berg, uh, Native Knits. So lovely. Oh, I'll link that below in case anyone wants to um, check that out because it's gorgeous. I love it. It looks so cozy as well. It is. It's really nice. She did such a really nice job knitting it. So I'm very appreciative of her doing that for the shop. But then on my needles, well, uh, right now I'm in the midst of Christmas knitting. Yeah. See, so you're already doing better. <laughs> I do this like every year. I should be starting my Christmas knits like in July. Yeah. So I'm not panicking and like knitting my fingers off. <laughs> um, so I'm knitting some hats for my nieces right now. And I have one done and I'm working on the second one. So here's the first one. Oh, I love that. And so the greenish kind of yarns are from my friend Patricia. She owns Tidal Yarns. Um, so this is Romney also that she naturally dyes. Really and then cool. this is some of our, oh, the pink is our ovejas. I love that. I love that color combination you've done. Thanks. My one niece was like, I asked my sister, I said, well, what's Hannah's favorite colors? And she said, pink and blue, but basically cotton candy colors. <laughs> like, all right, girl. So, yeah. I think this is pretty cotton candy-ish. Yeah. That's Not it being cool. like sickening, sweet kind of colors. Oh, no, it's gorgeous. And so, yeah, I heard it with the darker one. It looks really good. Yeah. The name of the pattern is, Pie uh, Piera, Piera, by Beryl Lee Claire. Oh, cool! Ooh, I will link that below as well. That's a fun pattern. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, so the girls are getting, my nieces are each getting one. Um, the other one that I'm doing is going to be like this this dark kind of green color with like yellow and kind of a rusty red. Oh, nice. 
So that's one. I have Dottie mitts on the needles right now that I got in super far. Oh, cute. Ooh, I love the colors you're doing. So yeah, this color with the natural brown. Oh, lovely. Oh, they're going to be cute. I'm so excited for those. They are so cute. I love this pattern. Oh, thank you. And then the other thing that I have kind of, I've been working on, it takes a little more concentration because I've never done um, a cardigan in this construction, which is great because I feel like I need to always be upping my skills. Definitely. So it's um, Heidi Kiermeyer's new, newest cardigan called um, Perseids. It's named after the meteor shower. Oh, cool. Um, so I haven't gotten super far on it. And this goes again. So it's kind of an all over eyelet pattern. So this is the front of the cardigan and then that's the back. Oh, I see it. Oh, no, I love an, an all over pattern when it comes yeah. to like cardigans and things. I'm a sucker for yeah. them. Oh, that's pretty. I love that texture. Right. Ooh. So this is very special yarn because this is yarn from our very first Ram Augustus. And I kind of pulled it aside a long time ago. Oh, nice. And so yeah, waiting, trying to figure out a good pattern for it. And I think it's gonna be really nice. I think that's gonna look gorgeous. Oh, what a special project. That's gonna be so nice. Yeah. Yeah. So those are the three-ish things that I'm working on right now. Oh, and one other thing. I have I always have kind of one of these going. So we started this this project called Warm Heads, Warm Hearts. And it's just basically kind of like a a charity knit kind of thing. Oh fun. For our school district here. Oh um, nice. And I I I talked with um, Whitney Hayward um, about if she would be willing to I wanted to give people a pattern suggestion and her hat pattern is montane hat the montane hat so it's just a very simple oh fun i love knits like that yeah just a very simple knit that anybody can wear yeah and so i have received 80 hats so far 80 from people all over pennsylvania new york Connecticut, Florida, Georgia. Oh, cool. Plus local people. Um, so yeah, this is all going to the school district. Um, and they can distribute it however it works. So yeah. Oh, nice. Oh, you'll have to um, send me the link and I'll share it with people below. If, um, if, sure. If people would like to um, donate a hat to you. Yeah, I'm just going to keep it as like an ongoing, on-running project and just continue to supply our school district and for as many hats as they feel like they need or. That's so cool. Ooh, we'll definitely link that because that's super fun. Yeah, so I always just kind of have one going like as a good travel nice. kind of. Ooh, I like, I do like a travel project though. because that's always fun, especially yeah. with stocking it. There's something totally. kind of like that I don't have to and think you don't about. Have to like figure out where you're at in the pattern. Because yeah, especially that's always a disaster. Oh my god, <laughs> I'm in the car. I'm such a child as well because I still get travel sick. Um, oh, no. I'm one of those people. There's normally we go on long car rides and there's me and Tilly because she gets travel sick. Kind of like, <laughs> um, <laughs> poor husband's like, oh my god, you two. <laughs> so, so it can't be anything where I have to like. I can actually actually knit um, because I don't have to look at it as long as it's stocking it. So I love a stocking it travel project. So I don't yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> Good child. So you're not turning green. <laughs> oh, Amanda, it's been lovely as always. I could, um, well, I can tell you, I have, I just have no idea how long we spoke for. We said we were going to try and keep it 45 minutes to an hour and I have completely lost all track of time um normally it's like at least three hours so whatever we've done True. this time <laughs> I'm sure, it unless like it is three short. hours 
Yeah, I, I don't think it is. I actually can't remember no. what time we officially I mean, for like our normal conversations, this is a short one. Oh my God, this is super our short. Normal. Yeah, our normal. <laughs> it was lovely to have you here on our YouTube channel. Um, I'm going to stick all the links below of um, things we've mentioned and places you can find Amanda. Um, but Amanda, is there anywhere else people can come and follow you um, or find your work or whatever you want them to know? Um, I would say, obviously, on social media, on Instagram and Facebook, we're just Prado de Lana. And then our website is pradodelana.com. And it might be great if you subscribe to our website and our newsletter. That way you always get updates and things like that and know what's what when it's going on so you know oh cool i will stick um all your links below so people can sign up to your newsletter and um, thank you thank you for joining us here and thank you to all of you who have been watching this we've had such a nice time thank you for giving me yet another excuse to talk to amanda and um <laughs> <laughs> i hope i've done an okay job for this episode of making stories knits with um hannah lisa will be back next time um and yeah, if you like what we're doing, please feel free to hit like and subscribe to our channel and we will see you next time. Um, thank you so much, everyone, and speak soon. Bye. Thank you, Claire.